Right, so welcome everyone. Today our webinar is on Hindu contributions to the world. Uh, my name is Ankur Patel. I'm the Director of Advancement for Hindu University of America and our special guests, our panelists, our uh, esteemed intellectuals are Dr. D.K. Hari and Dr. D.K. Hemahari. And I'll give them each a little bio, but, uh, and then combine, and then we'll just get into uh, the program because there are a lot of Hindu contributions to the world and we aren't gonna cover them in one webinar. That's why we have a whole course on it. But uh, Dr. D.K. Hari hails from a traditional Indian family. Uh, and he was schooled at the Rishi Valley School, then graduated from Madras Christian College and did his post-graduation in business administration from PSG College of Technology. Uh, he had a 20 year career as a management professional, managing family businesses in verticals and oil, gas, um, and headed up a marketing, headed up marketing for building industry project company. Uh, during which he has established brand sales and network and abroad. These are very well-traveled, educated people. Um, and then we have Dr. Dika Hemahari, who was uh, born in Mysore, grew up in Bombay. Uh, she doubled in gra and graduated in physics and computer technology from Bombay University. And her 20 year career span has been on in information technology, mainly on managing innovation and nurturing new technologies uh, through consulting, mentoring, business development. And she has traveled widely to many countries and also within India on professional as well as personal grounds. Uh, I don't think we're doing too much traveling right now, but uh, it's given her the I'm opportunity. Going. <laughs> it's given her the opportunity to learn about various cultures and widen her horizons, and she's going to share that with us today. She's learned Carnatic music since childhood, and uh, uh, Dr. D.K. Hari and Dr. Hema Hari both earned their doctorate degrees at Sri Sri University, and together, and this is the power of coming together, right? They started the Bharatian Initiative in Civilizational Studies back in 2000. Uh, Bharatian follows an interdisciplinary approach to researching, uh, researching from a Hindu perspective and provides an integrated narrative, bring all these things together of Hindu civilizations, which are published in association with the art of living. So with that brief introduction, I will hand it over and we'll have a little bit of a conversation. We'll take questions. You can put them in the chat, the Q and A box, but um, it's a pleasure to welcome our panelists to let us know and get into Hindu contributions of the world. I will stop sharing screen and if you have your presentation, feel free. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste to everybody. Thank you, Ankur, for that lovely introduction. And uh, actually to take off from your introduction, I mean, we are currently in this field of uh, Hindu civilization precisely because of our travel and uh, what we have seen world over uh, we have seen the similarities between the uh, Hindu civilization and the various other cultures. We've also seen what is very distinct about the uh, Hindu civilization and uh, how very little is said about it, how the Hindu narrative of the civilization is largely missing uh, in the global narrative. And uh, that is what prompted us to uh, get on to compile uh, knowledge about our civilization and uh, present it uh, fundamentally in a form that uh, can be taken to uh, people all over the world, common people, because a uh, lot of this uh, knowledge is uh, today available, unfortunately, uh, in scriptures, which are I mean, manuscripts, which are not very easily accessible. And even if you do lay hands on it, you cannot understand because of the language uh, in which it has been uh, written, uh, as well as, you know, you need scholars uh, who have really gone through the uh, rigor of these uh, scriptures to be able to explain to you what is written there and uh, how, do, how do you get that to a common man. So that is where we started Bharat Gyan to compile and uh, for about 10 years we were actually just uh, collating uh, because the, you know the more we would collate the more questions would arise and uh, these questions were uh, eventually ending up uh, corroborating one another. The answers, you know, the questions, the answers we would get would corroborate what we had found earlier and would lead on to the next question. So it was almost like a jigsaw, you know, jigsaw uh, pieces falling in together. And that was the beauty of it, you know. So we kind of ended up 
uh, going across a wide spectrum of subjects. And uh, we were uh, kind of giving a lot of multimedia talks for the first 10 years. And then only when once we kind of felt we had some critical mass, then we started putting books together. And uh, the second decade uh, was kind of spent in bringing out a lot of publications. Uh, so we have today uh, something that we call our autobiography of India collection, uh, where we have about 35 books in printed and in Kindle format, and about 60 books, which are just digital mini books, which are for a free read on our website, online read. And uh, we kind of post every day on the blog. Uh, and uh, we have about uh, more than 200 very short films uh, people can watch. Uh, you know, like uh, we normally uh, say, uh, if you have, uh, uh, you know, a couple of hours, then you can read a book, read our book. If you have uh, less than that, then you can read our articles, mini books. Even lesser than that, you read our blogs. Even lesser than that, you can watch our three-minute films. Even that you cannot spare, then you just come visit our website and, you know, get hold of the banners that we have put up for just a 30-second uh, glimpse. Uh, but uh, like you say, it's not enough to talk about this glorious civilization. And, uh, you know, that's, and that's why we have courses, right? Absolutely. Help, yeah, people, right. help people go through it because a lot of people don't want to read on their own and do that. And having that structure with a course and weekly with yeah. faculty. And one of the coolest things of taking courses with HUA for me has been seeing, the depending on the course size, people from across the world, Hindus from across the world, maybe I think in your exploring Hinduism course uh, with teens and parents this last quarter, you had over a hundred students. It was exciting just yes. to see how much interest in the diversity. And so taking the course, I think is what we're pushing here. But in case you can't take the course, watch the free webinar again, take out this material, but, uh, and then you get to interact individually. And uh, as, you know, Dr. D.K. Harry, Dr. Hamahari are responsive by email, answering questions. That's definitely a strength of being part of the university. Yes, actually, that's when, you know, once we wrote all those books, we felt, oh, my God, there is so much. And actually, there is still so much more to write. And uh, that's when we felt, you know, there is so much that people will need some guiding to be able to go to the right, uh, you know, material in the right order. And uh, so which is why we started uh, fashioning these uh, Hindu civilization course. I you know, interestingly, if you see Hinduism, uh, cannot be treated as a religion uh, the way, uh, you know, currently uh, the Western view of religion is all about. It is uh, beyond, much beyond that. And uh, so to understand this, you have to actually go to the civilization, the roots of the civilization. And uh, that's why we call it the course on the Hindu civilization rather than just the uh, religion alone. And uh, we, we cover a various uh, variety of facets. And, uh, you know, I would, we would just like to walk you through a little bit of uh, why there is uh, relevance to studying about this Hindu civilization. And, uh, you know, I would like to actually share. Can I share our screen, Nankur? Yes, please do. Please do. So fundamentally, you know, in uh, Bharat Gyan, our endeavor, we started uh, looking at it as civilizational studies uh, to understand about our uh, civilization. See, one thing that is uh, that stands out very distinctly is that this is a living civilization. While today there have been uh, you know, many ancient civilizations of the world, and uh, very sadly, many of them are not uh, in the sense of practicing civilizations. You, you need to go to museums to understand and see those civilizations. Whereas uh, for the Hindu civilization, uh, you know, when you can, it is still being practiced today. It is still alive and vibrant uh, in amongst people even today. So uh, with that, uh, that is one thing that is uh, very distinctive about the civilization. And uh, why we felt when we looked at this entire compilation as we were compiling, 
we felt that there is a lot. It is not just studying about history or religion uh, or something about the past. It, it is something that can actually make ourselves very relevant in today's times. And uh, because this civilization, A, is continuing, B, has actually been a very successful civilization. And it has been, it has flourished with prosperity for more than two millennia. So that means they must have done something good and something correct. So what are the learnings that we can take from this civilization is very, very important uh, for us. And that is why uh, it becomes very relevant to study about Hinduism today. One, on the spiritual side, while it can give you a lot of uh, uh, fulfillment and personal individual growth from a spiritual perspective, uh, it also has a lot of relevance to do with your growth in the society as well. And uh, therefore, you know, we, uh, we have compiled these courses as a knowledge tool and uh, to build awareness of a sustainable way of living, uh, which was as practiced by the Hindus from eons ago. And uh, these courses, I mean, can be taken both by Hindus and people who are non-Hindus as well. Uh, for the Hindus, of course, because it will connect them back with their roots, uh, it can instill them with uh, pride and uh, confidence uh, to see what they can do in present uh, uh, times as well. And for others, see, it's very, very interesting that uh, the uh, Hindu civilization had understood the essence of creating prosperity. And uh, that has that that is actually replicable in a very subtle way across the world by other civilizations as well. So what is that nuance? How does each civilization, how can they also become flourishing, prosperous? Is the, the key to that lies in trying to understand what the Hindus did right. So even for others, there is rele uh, relevance to uh, carry back uh, inspiration to emulate relevantly. The word relevant is very important here. And uh, if we find that, you know, we all know that uh, if you have to scale high, then your roots need to be strong. Your foundation has to be strong. And if you go back to the roots, that is where, you know, the, the roots of all the problems that we face today, the kind of environment we are living in today, uh, our own identity and, uh, you know, the struggle we, we have with our own identity, and also not knowing what kind of traits we have, what kind of legacy to leverage. So if we can go and understand our roots, then that is when we can strengthen our foundation and, uh, you know, lead out to branching better. And uh, this, this is the point, you know, we talk about ability to relate. So to relate to which, whichever land you are in, whichever kind of uh, environment you are in, the resources and strengths, trying to understand that was something that the Hindus did very successfully with their land, which was India. And fundamentally, what is this India itself? What is the extent of India, which was called Bharat uh, in the, uh, by the Hindus? And uh, how far was this extent? Not the political India as we see today. And uh, what were its strengths? What were the resources of this land and the strengths of this people? So that is what we will get to understand. And uh, part of it is genetic today, even today. So Hindus world over still carry those kind of traits with them. And part of it comes from understanding your surroundings, which is something that people can replicate uh, world over. So as we say, you know, this uh, today, if you, you find Hindus have spread uh, all over the world. They are playing very prominent roles. I'm sure Americans will uh, you know, be able to relate with that uh, as of today. And, uh, uh, you know, in the global affairs, uh, Hindus are beginning to have a say. And, uh, but what, who is a Hindu? And uh, what makes up a Hindu? And what is the culture? How do you relate to yourself? And leverage the connect with your Hinduism, your civilization uh, to, you know, really spring forth. And uh, today we talk about, uh, you know, the fourth industrial revolution that's going to come about. And uh, this, for this fourth industrial revolution, uh, people are talking about social and emotional skills. So how does this knowledge help you in that kind of a scenario is uh, what we will see because we will, Hinduism, if you see the way 
the civilization was structured, the way the education system was structured uh, was such that the focus was on soft skills first and then the hard skills. So those kind of soft skills are what the world is now coming to realize as being very essential. Uh, I'll just show you that little bit about this soft skill. See, if you look at the uh, uh, projection that they talk about the future, they talk about this fourth industrial revolution. And uh, they say that some of the skills which are going to be needed are going to be SEL skills, which are social, social and emotional skills. And there are 16 skills which have been identified by the World Economic Forum as of uh, 2016. And if you look at those 16 skills, there are six skills which are called the core foundational skills, which are the uh, typical reading, writing skills. And uh, then there are uh, competency skills. So literacy, numeracy, scientific literacy, ICT. So all of these are the core. Then they talk about competency skills, which are about critical thinking and problem solving, creativity and so on. Then they are identifying six very essential skills which are called character qualities. And there is where they're talking about curiosity, initiative, your adaptability, the grit, your leadership, and all of this. And all of this, if you see, they are really connected with the mindset with which you move about. And that mindset, if you have the confidence and if you have the dare uh, about first your own identity and your strengths, that is when these character qualities will really come out. And to do that, you really need to understand about, because this cannot be taught as a curriculum. It's, it's not a curriculum subject. It has to be inspired. And what best uh, than you know the legacy left behind by our ancestors, and especially of a successful civilization, to help inspire uh, the youth of today. And uh, therefore, to give exposure and awareness uh, that that's going to help mold the character. And uh, that is where we see this knowledge helping us, you know, otherwise it becomes uh, very often people sometimes say you're historians. We say, no, we're not historians. We are focusing on civilizational study to understand the civilization, because that is what made us, uh, you know, we have grown out of the civilization, not just an aspect of history alone. And uh, it's very important to understand this aspect and, uh, that is what really shapes us. Uh, our strengths come from our legacy. And uh, Hinduism, no, I mean, uh, there is really no doubt about it. Everybody will agree that there is a large legacy to leverage in uh, Hinduism. The amount of knowledge base, uh, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, if you look at the name itself, Bharat for the land, uh, it comes from Bha, which means uh, light, enlightenment and uh, rat, which means to relish knowledge. So Bharat are the people who relish knowledge and who have left behind a lot of knowledge for us to use. And uh, so why don't we put it to use? So that's what this uh, courses are all going to be about. It covers a whole gamut of what you see, all these aspects it, it covers and brings in. When you do a course of exploring Hinduism, be it the overview course or uh, what Hindus have contributed to the world at large over the last few millennia. It covers all these aspects. It's a multi-dimensional perspective that we, we bring in easily into these courses. That's what you'd get to see. So fundamentally, we will be seeing from the identity perspective, then the geography, the extent of the land, which is called Bharat. And, uh, uh, and what are the advantages of having been located? There are some very, very interesting things uh, if there are people from the uh, first summer batch here, uh, I'm sure they will be able to relate to it. And uh, then uh, there is a lot of history. Uh, since how long, how far behind can you trace the civilization? And uh, because Hindus are, they must be familiar with terms that, they, that keep popping up, yuga and manvantara and things like that. So what do they really mean? And uh, how far back? Can you trace the history of the Hindus uh, as a people? And, and as far as industry, trade, and navigation are concerned, the other three aspects, we'll be dealing with that in this uh, course on uh, Hindu contributions to the world. It extensively, we'll be dealing with those three aspects. Society, we did, uh, we'll be dealing with in uh, 
exploring Hinduism. The you know, overview, the overview, first part. Both society as well as timekeeping. The festivals part of it, uh, we will deal probably in a future course, uh, sometime in uh, 2021, which will, which will be we have a Hindu course, so that we will be doing, doing it in the upcoming semester, later semester. Of course, education and language will do in the export Hinduism course and ethos also. So we are giving a full basket. We are offering a full basket to look at Hinduism from all these perspectives so that we understand the whole dimension of Hinduism. I think there were some seven questions. Do you want to take some of them? Uh, I think there are some questions. Questions here, 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 here. No, no, no. That's no, no. That's, that's fine. Um, so let's yeah. wait a little bit before we take questions. Let's let them pile okay. up and you get through your presentation. Okay. Okay. But let me yeah. just, we just emphasize. Slides. We just look, at the, slides. look at Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Please so, go ahead. So, again, there's so many different assets. If you, just, just briefly, if you go back, just one. Oh, this one's fine also. Look at all the different areas and focuses, right? You can't get into all of that in one webinar. And I know people think you're going to get all of the understanding of Hindu contribution sometimes in one hour. That's what you come into a webinar expecting. I apologize. That's not what's going to happen, but I'm sure uh, we'll get some very interesting, maybe some high level contributions that are particularly interesting to you or that you think the audience will be interested. But obviously they're going through what they will cover in their different range of courses. And we encourage you to take it. Um, and I have a poll for you later to indicate your interest. Please stay around and complete that when we do that but I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. Just wanted to give that little disclaimer because sometimes people feel like they're going to learn yeah. everything about Hinduism in one hour in one of these webinars. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I get those, I understand. Sometimes the, the messaging feels that way. Just wanted to make sure that our over 120 Basically, attendees do that right now. Not enough. A lifetime is not enough. <laughs> to relish Hinduism, as she says correctly, a lifetime is not enough. You need a century and probably a few millennia because it's so wonderful. It's a, it's a big, nice mesh. It's a huge jigsaw. It's not just a puzzle. It's a nice big jigsaw which fits into each other so beautifully. It sort of meshes in beautifully. You only get to see facets of it. And not just actually, you know, what I was also wanting to say is not one birth. You need many births. You need to go through the cycle of births actually to evolve, to understand. Uh, and uh, actually, it is not to understand Hinduism then you evolve to understand what the universe and the cosmos is all about. And uh, with each birth as your consciousness keeps developing further and further. And these are the kind of things that you will see when we start uh, immersing ourselves uh, in uh, Hindu thought and uh, Hindu literature and uh, uh, the uh, Hindu way of looking at things. And uh, uh, I mean, this is all about what we have been looking at as part of the civilization. So we have, so what we've done is in these courses, we'll be sort of trying to share with you what we have been able to collate together in our journey over the last 20 years on different aspects of Hinduism. And more, and that's what we're trying to bring out. Of course, most of it is already available in our written material, which will be part of the course material, as well as available, already available on Kindle. But more importantly, we'll be there to take your questions on yeah. each of this aspect and happy to answer them as many as that's possible by us in the course period time itself because that is what we encourage you to come up with because the hindu thought encourages questioning and answers questioning that is what upanishad this the word upanishad itself means upa means near upanayana near upadesa between Bhagwan Shri Krishna, Narjuna, Upadesa, because they are next to each other. Upa is next to each other. Upa. So, it, Upadhyaya, Adhyaya, learning, Upadhyaya, learning, being beside a teacher, a guru. Okay, so that, so here we have the effort of Hindu thought is we encourage our colleagues in the session to ask questions. And wherever we know the answers, we'll be happy to share the answers. And where we need to search, let's all jointly search for answers. Because it's an unending search. That's what it is. And that is the very ethos of the Hindu thought. Where questioning, everything is by questioning. And we showed in our first course on Exploring Hinduism where the first created was Brahma. In the process of Big Bang, Brahma and Visphota creation. Even he asked the first question of the creator. Who was there? That is Vishnu, his father. As to how he, that is Brahma, came to be. And 
So questioning starts from the moment of Big Bang, the Brahmanda Viswotak. So it's very innate in nature to question. And Buddha in his sermon very clearly says, ask questions and don't be satisfied with the answers. The way a person checks the gold from a goldsmith with a wet stone, check the answer for yourself. So that's where it is. So which is what, uh, since I've been from Rishivali, uh, there's a person named uh, Rameshra who has commented extensively. Question, we'll get to that. So Jiddu Krishnamurti also spoke about the questioning thought of Hindu. So, questioning is a very innate part of the Hindu ethos. And we encourage you to ask questions in these courses. And we'll be happy to take those questions. Uh, well, interestingly, you know, during summer course, uh, we used to have uh, between, you know, it used to be actually originally for 60 with uh, some 60 amount minutes. of 60 minutes with some overflow of questions, but it used to go on for um, more than one hour, 40 minutes and so on. Uh, questions our video recordings would just go on and on and the questions, nobody would just feel like signing off, neither they nor us because they had so many questions and we had so much to tell them as well. Uh, so it, it was really wonderful actually. So we encourage our uh, session colleagues to ask us all these questions. And, and the way we've structured, you know, like at least the two courses that are uh, going on currently, uh, in this, the overview, what we talk about is, it is an approach to uh, understanding the Hindu thought. And uh, since the Hindu civilization also encompasses the Hindu religion, and every religion, if you really go back to see, uh, go back, you will see that all of them are differentiated in their different approach to explaining creation, the science of creation. It is the science of creation, the thought of creation that is held by different cultures is what distinguishes various religions that have sprung, sprung up amongst these uh, cultures. And uh, uh, that uh, fundamentally, we will be starting with that uh, particular unit uh, we will have about uh, four sessions on just understanding creation from the Hindu thought. We have beautiful multimedia presentations with animations. And after that, we go down. Therefore, once you have creation, then you have the divinities. And everybody knows about the number of divinities that are there in Hinduism, and which also today form a source of confusion for many, and uh, a lot of symbolisms uh, which are associated and how do you understand them? And uh, sometimes in some cases, how do you even, uh, uh, you know, because many a times they're all derided as well. So how do you explain or how do you defend these kind of symbolisms as a Hindu oneself? And uh, so divinities forms another unit, uh, which is again about three to four sessions. And uh, from there we move on because once creation is there, that is when, your universe is created, your space is there, you have time. And how did the Hindus understand this time? And how did they very easily straddle the space-time continuum? That is a beauty in itself. It's a marvel of the world, frankly. And uh, that's something that we will see about the Hindu uh, way of timekeeping, the calendar, uh, because um, Every Hindu today, especially the modern generation, the younger generation, they're always confused. Why do we have a separate Hindu birthday and which comes on different dates each year? And why don't Hindu festivals fall on the same date every year? Uh, as for the Gregorian calendar, why do they come, why do they come on different, different days and uh, so on? So uh, these are things that we will get a very good insight into uh, when we try to understand how the Hindus kept time, what kind of calendars they followed. And uh, from there on, you know, it, it also touches upon a little bit about festivals. And uh, after that, we move on to the society itself. How were the Hindus organized as a society, which is what helped them to be, uh, you know, prosperous. And uh, today, uh, people may talk about uh, how Hindu women are treated uh, in some parts of uh, India, but... Uh, you know, it will really be an eye opener when you see the, the space that was uh, given, that the women held. It was not given to them. It, they held it by right and uh, 
what was this gender by balance? nature not right. just by right by nature the, the hindu women had by nature by their own nature self so not given by me the moment you say give the give the women hindu or any women rights it means there's somebody superior to give so there's no giving in the hindu society rights for it women it was not empowerment because when you say empower then somebody else is empowering you so then it, it really loses the idea of equality or uh, you know, parity in the society it was not empowerment the society was a beautifully knit society and what was that society like uh, that is going to be one uh, other unit which we will see about and the caste system of the hindus uh, you cannot uh, delink these two hinduism and caste system uh, they just go very intertwined so how did you how do you understand that and was it a burden or was it a uh, well designed system called jati varna because caste system was imposed on hinduism during the colonial rule actually it is a very uh, Christian connect, uh, I mean, construct on Hinduism. Whereas what we, what the Hindus have had, which was natural to Hindus, was a jati varna system. And what it was, the difference between the two, we'll discuss. Yeah. And, so uh, if I can just add on that, next week's webinar is specifically on the varna jati system and deconstructing that caste mythology because we know it comes up. There's questions, and we're gonna have a full hour webinar where we're gonna deconstruct that, and in the future we're gonna have a course on it. So it plays in, uh, you have to address it. But to me, it feels like caste is intertwined with Hinduism the same way that slavery is intertwined with Christianity, right? It's something that happened in the past that have been reformed and projecting that and saying that this is what Hinduism is, is it's a lie, it's false. It's attacking and uh, that, that straw man fake argument. And so we are gonna deconstruct caste as a, and again, the word caste as, it was said it's, it's a Portuguese word for race. And then they impose that on a whole different system that they had no understanding, which is typical of European colonization, where they learn Sanskrit to tell us what the Bhagavad Gita really means. But of course, they misinterpret it. And uh, there's this term gaslighting. That's, that's what is going on. And we are combating that. We're challenging that with these kinds of one hour webinars, but the whole core system. So um, sorry to interrupt. Continue on. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, and, you and then we will finally end uh, that particular uh, course with overview. Overview, co overview course with uh, the plunders and the struggles that uh, the Hindu civilization had to go through, uh, despite which it still continues to live today. So that is part of that. And then from there, because you will see that uh, why were the Hindus plundered? Because no, why will you, will somebody go and plunder somebody who's poor? No, never. So because they were plundered because they were very rich, they were very prosperous. There was something that the Hindu civilization had to offer to the world for millennia, right from uh, even before Alexander came uh, uh, eastwards. Uh, he came up to Persia and then after, see his aim was only to uh, defeat the Persians because the Persians and the Greeks always had this constant uh, 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 struggle. You know, sometimes it was the Greeks and sometimes it was the Persians who were dominating. So for him, it was important to quell the Persians. But after that, he wanted to come up to India because he had, Greeks were familiar by then, even then, about the riches in India, both in terms of uh, material wealth as well as knowledge. And Alexander actually had a mandate to bring back scholars from India to Greece. Uh, so- Kalanos. So that, that so, what were these contributions that the Hindu had to uh, Hindu civilizations had to give to the world? So we have divided it into two parts because it's enormous. So one part we look at in the realm of matter, and then the other one in the realm of mind. And uh, it is not just uh, a kind of a jingoism to say, "Oh, we gave this, we gave that, we did this, we did that," but more like you know I told in the beginning the relevance. So if we did that and we had been successful, how did we practice those industries? How did we stay successful? How did we stay sustained, both in terms of prosperity and in terms of the resources? That is what is of importance to us, and that is what we will be uh, seeing as well during that particular course. And uh, in, in So what we're trying to here bring out in this two-part course on Hindu contributions to the world is, in the realm of matter and in the realm of mind. Because 
mind and matter are the twinning factors of any contribution, both gross and subtle, animate, inanimate, mind and matter. And this there's always a tile, uh, there's always a tussle between mind or matter or matter or mind. We are saying no, we, there's no tussle, it is mind and matter. It's an intertwining of both. Because a lot of I'm sure you've heard of enough sayings about mind or matter or matter or mind. No, this is not over, but along with intertwining of both. So there has been a very strong Hindu contribution in the field of matter and in the field of mind. And that's why it's actually a 40 session course. It's a two part course in the realm of matter and in the realm of mind. That's why we wanted to sort of bring it out in this form so we can easily see how we have the Hindu thought straddles both. It's not just again some thought of some Rishi stroking his beard and then some Swamiji stroking his beard and then coming up in the field of only philosophy or psychology. No. Hard matter. Physical matter is also what we contribute. We'll just see a glimpse of that uh, very briefly now. Uh, like he said, it's not possible to cover a lot in a webinar. But just show you a little bit of uh, what these kind of things were. Uh, but before that, you know, uh, we'll just take you through one uh, aspect that uh, everybody has been uh, familiar with. See, we all have been reading in our history books that it is Vasco da Gama who found the sea route to India, right? That, that's exactly how people phrase it. Vasco da Gama found the sea route to India. And uh, this is because at that time, uh, we'll look at the history part of it uh, in, during the course. But uh, briefly, because at that point in time, uh, Europe was looking for a way to come to India, the Hindus, to uh, lay access, to get access to the riches directly. Because until then, it was through the Arabs uh, who were trading from the Hindu world. But uh, for various circumstances, due to various reasons, the Europeans wanted to come to India directly. So when he comes all the way up to here, until then, they hadn't come directly uh, to India. So just, just notice this. In fact, that is what led Christopher Columbus also to go. Uh, Actually, Christopher Columbus did not want to find America. He wanted to find India. India. And so, by, because they knew that the world was round by then, he thought he would sail westward. To reach India. So that's why he goes there. And what he reached, he called it India. That's why he got the term West Indies. And, and the, the people Red became Indians. Red Indians. So, he, till his death, Christopher Columbus was very clear that he had found India, not America. It was only later, Amerigo Vespucci, you all know better, uh, uh, who so, further went and discovered the American land. But on, uh, you know, a few years later, it was Vasco da Gama and he set sail. Now, uh, he follows his predecessor's route up to here. Nobody had crossed this point, which is why once they could cross this point and then look towards India, this point came to be called Cape of Good Hope. It was Good Hope. It was Cape of Good Hope because beyond that means you, if you cross that, you can reach India. And that is where Vasco da Gama, when he is waiting there to see how to get into open seas and come eastwards further, the, he sees ships which are 10 times larger. He writes in his own log that he comes across ships that are 10 times larger, the Indian ships, and it is only these Indian ships which uh, actually take him from here all the way across and he lands in the coast of India. He lands at Calicut. Now, the question would then be, if Vasco da Gama and Columbus had taken ships, the largest ships of their times from, uh, you know, the European ships, one was uh, sponsored by the Spanish and Vasco da Gama by Portuguese. And they were, mind you, the largest ships that they could build then. And here he says he, sh he finds ships 10 times larger. We look at those ships and their names and designs and all, all the later, later in, the, in course. the course. But then, you know, you, you all would have, you would be having a doubt now. India has been trading in spices. So the, the moment you talk about uh, uh, trade from India, people always connect it with spices. Now for spices, why do you need such large ships? That would be the question that should come up very naturally. And that is when you will see that, and so, so like, you know, for the Europeans, it was like, uh, this civilization was like a rainbow and the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, which gave India, East Indies, West Indies, Red Indians, Indonesia, everything that was 
uh, very the, India centric world for many centuries together. That was what it was. So, so that was a very Hindu centric world. We'll even okay. see how the word India came. I mean, how did Bharat come to become India itself? Uh, that will be a very interesting uh, story that we will uh, see. And uh, here, if you see, therefore, this the reason they needed such huge ships was because. This civilization was dealing with some big five. What is the big five? We'll, we'll deal in, in, in a few sessions. So that is a big thing. So this is what the world wanted. So one of the great Hindu contributions to the world economy, the world development on multiple perspectives is this big five for a couple of millennia and more. All this we'll go into detail in the actual course. So, when you say mind and matter, matter plays a big part. So it was not just only spirituality and uh, yoga or uh, uh, that was also their part of the, the mind. The subtle knowledge has definitely gone. But how did it go? It went along with all these things. Fundamentally, these things went first. And along with that, all the other things have gone. And it was things like iron and steel. Uh, in fact, you'll be very surprised to see that uh, this civilization, you know, the Hindu, ancient Hindu civilization was almost like the arms dealer of the world. Arms supplier. Arms supplier of the world then. And uh, since it's, it, it's America, will uh, these courses we're doing mostly the Americans will tell you. All of you know the American national anthem, right? And do you know where it was written? Where it was first, first written? Composed. Composed. On board a ship built by... Built in India. It was an Indian ship in the Boston Harbor on which the, the Star Spangled Banner was written. Was written. And so, that's a beautiful story. I mean, shipping India was a Hindu contribution to the world. It was not, ships were not used only for trading. The Hindus traded in ships itself. They built ships. They, they built ships. They uh, where uh, they they served as uh, shipwrights, they also uh, uh, traded using these ships, and so these were the large, uh, uh, you know, material that were uh, traded from India. Besides many things, the story of sugar, of course, is a very bitter story, uh, and uh, we'll see that in great depth. Yeah, because th that's what we'll be dealing in a couple of sessions. The story of sugar is bitter, very bitter. While the taste may be sweet. That's what we'll be dealing in on in the Hindu contribution to the world in the subject of matter. So, so this like that and then uh, uh, because each of this actually is, uh, you know, something that goes on into hours of sessions and also on diamond. Uh, it, it's uh, it'll come very surprising that uh, diamonds are something that the Hindus gave the world. Diamonds are forever. Uh, so it's not course. just a Hindu living film. <laughs> it's also that Indians, it's a huge Indian contribution to the world. So uh, we see there are some 54 chats. Questions. So. Do you want to take some questions, Ankur, now? Yeah, this is perfect. We're at 9.45. Um, I'm not going to ask you to stay for an hour extra, but I, I'm sure if there's a few <laughs> questions that go uh, a little bit longer, we'll go past the top of the hour. But in these Last 15 minutes, let me just clarify the question. So a lot of people put questions in the chat, and then we also have a Q&A box. And so in right. the Q&A box, these questions stick, and it's easier to see, and we can either type an answer, and some people have been using right. it, some people have been putting it in the chat. And uh, if it's all right, uh, let me just... It's not it's, it's, it's um, there, there's, there's such a range of questions. It, I, and I know you're looking at them. If there are any particular that jump out at you that you want to answer no. first... Can I answer? Can can answer Maybe someone? we'll take the Q&A first. And then yeah, let's do the Q&A box example, first. Samlesh Sharda has asked a question about uh, the comparison between Western economic model and the Hindu economic model. Good question. Yeah, good question. Uh, see, in the Western economic model, if you remove the word scarcity or scarce, you hardly have any economics. All economic theories are based on something that has to be scarce. Right from Adam Smith to W. 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 Ross to a whole host of them. Okay. Because I've also been an economic student 30 years ago, a student of economics. But if you look at the Hindu model of economics, it deals from a prosperity angle. There's a fundamental difference. It's two different things. It's like chalk and cheese. You talk with prosperity in mind. There you talk with scarcity in mind. That's a basic difference. And everything goes from the base. 
grows from there on. Actually, in our book, U Turn India, we deal with it extensively with this thought. It's a book that we wrote about 10 years ago. We deal with it extensively. I utters the word Hindu. There is mental block among the adherents of Middle Eastern religion. How is it to be mitigated? Actually, you know something, uh, even today in the Arab world, uh, there, there, is, there are some girls who are called Al-Hen. Hen. And the word, uh, this means that these are, uh, th that the person is precious to their family. Hen means precious uh, as such. But if you go to where this word is derived from, Hen is derived from the word Hind, which is the name for uh, the Hindu civilization, for the Arabs. So Hind is what was precious to the Arab world. If you see all their trade, or whatever they did was based on the Hindu civilization. So the Hindu civilization was actually very, very precious to them. And that is why they went on to name their girls al -Hen. And I think today we'll have to uh, strive to bring back uh, this uh, uh, thought and uh, you know try to forge back the uh, Hindu-Arab connect once again. And uh, that is something that, in fact, we've written a book called the Indo-Arab Connect as well, which is there on our uh, website uh, for, a for free, free read. read. So you can read that. It's for free read available there in our mini book section. You can do that. I'll just take a, there's a question. Uh, let me just let me just add a little bit to this um, kind of mental block. It's not just one group of people. It's a global. Hindu Dvesha has been a project of European colonialism. And they've, you know, info, not and they've projected these biases in media, in our culture, in the Simpsons, right? Across the board, we see it. And we have a whole series on Hindu, well, we had a webinar on Hindu phobia. There's other organizations that are digging into this, but how do we address it? By learning about our culture, being confident and representing it in a positive, inclusive, accepting, modern way. So I'm gonna launch the poll right now. If you could fill out this poll, are you interested in enrolling in exploring Hinduism for teens and parents in the fall? Yes, no, maybe I have questions, maybe later. And then are you interested in uh, Hindu contributions to the world? So if you're interested in both, let us know, one or the other, we follow up. We have a uh, Pragyaji who will call you. Um, and some of you webinar regulars uh, know that Pragyaji calls and, and has a conversation, follows up and will plug you into the system. And as, as you can, see and feel we want to be inclusive we want to answer questions we want you to participate so please be a part of hindu university of america and we will continue answering your questions uh if you want to just keep on going so, through the q a uh, box i think it's perfect one, uh, could you explain the justification for the varna or caste system and its relevance today with all its negative connotations uh, yes briefly, uh, briefly. They, Yes, today we uh, sadly have negative connotations, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, very, very briefly, uh, if you really want to look at it, it is fundamentally the four G's. It is grow, it is give, it is guard, and it is guide. These were the four varnas, actually. The grower, the giver, the guard, the guard, and the guide. And if you look at any society needs these four people, these four kinds of people. And that is what it was all about. And very sadly, it was broken. And, uh, uh, and of course, once the process started, uh, various things grew around it. And uh, uh, now it's as slippery as a moss. Uh, so, uh, but, but it helps to understand that, uh, to at least uh, know uh, how, how societies work. Uh, so we will look at that in very uh, great detail uh, during the course. But know? fundamentally, that if the moment you look at it like that, then you will understand automatically what Sir, all this all, was all about. Uh, Sabijit, it's uh, Thakur. It's not Varna or caste. It's two different things. Let's be clear. It was made to sound similar by the colonial people. Varna is different. Caste is different. Caste is a stratified. Varna is where it's, you can move. So fundamentally, the two different things, it's like one being uh, static and, uh, and one being very movable. So they're two different things fundamentally. It was not just moving. It was an adjustable, flexible thing. Flexible and by choice, each in the different choice. And uh, 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 that is a point. I know whenever we speak about uh, caste or jati varna, there are a lot of questions. That's why we have two sessions on it. 
you're welcome. We'll discuss all these points there one by one. And uh, certainly, yes. And uh, uh, please send me emails if you have questions that you don't want to ask. I put my email in the chat. And if it is for yeah, the hurries, yeah, okay. I'll forward it over to them. But uh, if you have a general question, please send it to me and I'll, I'll navigate it to the best person or people to answer. Oh, yes. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see, we see, Hinduism is a religion created by oh, the British. We'll read out the question. Huh. If you haven't already, could you opine on the coinage of Hinduism as a religion from what was Sanatana Dharma? Yes, we have one session on this in exploring Hinduism, a full uh, one and a half hour session on this word alone, because the, we are very clear that the word Hinduism is a construct created by the British colonists and, this, and the British Indian courts, including the Supreme Court of India. There is no Hinduism otherwise, but for it was created by the British. Whereas what we have was terminology, the terminology and terminology. they, they brought all the religions into one basket called Hinduism because they needed a common foe to attack. They could not see if they want to shoot an arrow. If you have, if you have like a Hydra, you have multiple heads, <laughs> which head will you shoot the arrow at? So they want, they brought all the heads of the Hydra to a single head to shoot their arrow. That is why they created a religion called Hinduism and made it, made it one. Hinduism was not created by Hindus. Hinduism was created by the British administrators. And, and interestingly the for them, Hinduism was Anything which was non-Christian and non-Islam, it it is it didn't really uh, mean to, to analyze and group, but anything fundamentally non-Christian and non-Islam was uh, Hinduism. Hinduism. And actually, Hinduism is an honorable name they gave to Hindus before because before they called us Hindus, the British colonists gave us another name. They had another name for us. It was called. Gen two G E E N T O G E N T O G E N T O Gen two. Do you know what it means? It comes from a very Indian word called Jantu. <laughs> Jantu meaning creepy, Creature. crawly creatures, insects, pests. <laughs> so we, so the the colonizers had called us creepy, crawly creatures and pests. That's what they called us. From that, they gave us a much more honorable name called Hinduism. Hindus. So it's of being called creatures. So we will look at this history, you know, of how. So then that that should now ask uh, raise the question. So why did India have so many religions then? So if they were, you know, they, there was just this one group of people. Why, why did they have so many religions in this one land, which was called Bharat? And what did they vary in these different religions? So all of this is what we will have to understand, and to understand that you have to go back to creation, which we call Srishti Vigyan. So unless you go back to understanding what caused so many religions and how they varied, what, what were the points on which they varied, then you will not be able to understand why there was this commonality that the British could see amongst all these different people. And therefore, why did they also see that there was something called a dharma, which was common to these various religions, it was also common to a Buddhist. It was also common to a, a Jain a person from the Jain faith. So what is this dharma? Sikh. And Everybody. Sikh. All so of what is this dharma? So all of this is what we will be able to differentiate when we uh, uh, you know, understand this history. And uh, see, uh, see, there's a question from Srinivas Rao, Rao and Prema Rao. They ask about the, the details to corroborate about Hindu religion as uh, Singh. It's there in our book. Uh, Breaking the Myths About Society, available on Kindle, please read it. So, there are a couple of chapters on it, which we deal with in detail. Yes. Why did this magnificent and marvelous civilization let it slip away starting in 9th century and ending in 2014? <laughs> ending in 2014, no, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are not get, getting into any politics whatsoever in, in any of our uh, research. We are, we are very non-political, you know, continue on civilization perspective. Yes, it's been unfortunate slip after many millennia of being high and doing very well. And uh, there's a term for this, uh, which we use a, where, see, it, it's a cyclical wheel, where sometimes the wheel goes on top, sometimes the, the wheel goes bought down, cyclical. Now, since we know what it is, with this knowledge, let's get this cycle of the wheel back up again. It's in our hands. That's why we wrote the book called You Turn India. You, each one of us can turn Hinduism around by our own efforts. That's what we can do, which is what our, 
our role should be, because having this knowledge, when you say Bharata, where we are people who relish knowledge, let us use this knowledge to bring back Hinduism to its days of glory once again in this new millennium. Yeah. Yes. And, and many hands make for lighter work. So all of us working together, however you feel, and Hindu University of America is a platform for Hindus across the world. It is your university. We want to be inclusive. We partner with different organizations and experts in the field, and we will continue to do exactly that because we are trying to be apolitical, right? Not taking, but there, everyone throws it at you anyway, and we have to be able to address it. Um, the, the, the broad conversation with calm, collect, knowledge, wisdom, and that's what we're trying to do. Yes. And yes, yeah, you can call it, we have to call it uh, Sanatana, fundamentally a Dharmic civilization. We are, that's what it, it has been. And uh, what is Tattva Gyan in uh, Hinduism? See, when we look at the divinities, you know, we will understand uh, that uh, the pantheon of Indian divinities, you can look at them. Some of them are historic avatars. And there are various levels, you know, Vyuha to divinity. And, of Vyuha, the five Vyuha are there. And uh, Tattva, actually many of the divinities, the Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, all of them, they are fundamentally Tattvas. They are the essence. They are the Principal. principles in uh, the cosmos. And uh, understanding this essence, the core, is uh, Tattva Gyan and uh, getting to relate with them, to leverage these principles in your daily life. You know, that is what Hinduism is all about. Actually, if you say it's a way of life, it is a way of life uh, which is driven by knowledge uh, to know and realize that there are various principles and uh, in play in the universe. And how do you connect with those? How do you leverage them uh, for your own uh, progress in life, uh, both spiritual and physical? Uh, neither of them were ignored. Both were essential. And uh, that is uh, the Hindu way of life in, uh, in, in a sattva, in a essence as well. And you ask, what is a sanatanist? You're saying, what is, what is it like being a sanatanist? The very word sanatana is very interesting. It means very old as well as ever young. Sanatana. Look at it. So it is new, latest, it's ever young. It's absolutely the present as well as it's very old ancient. So it spans that whole thing. That is Sanatana. So you can be as ancient as the, the cosmos itself and as young as your newborn baby. So your current, your to, to now, that's what Sanatana is all about. Ah, the other questions are like, those are more difficult to answer. <laughs> Have you ever tried to influence NCRT? It's easier no. to answer about Hinduism than to answer about questions <laughs> like this. No, no, no. <laughs> our, our knowledge that we have been able to fortunately call it is available to be used by people, those who want. Okay. We are not, uh, uh, we, we are here to share with people who want it. We are always ready. So that's been our single line. Uh, okay, let's go. Uh, just a reminder, we have, we have a poll open. 59 out of 101 people have uh, completed the poll. Please complete it. If it I'm going to end it and then share it again. So if you didn't see it, it'll pop up again. Please complete it. Uh, it'll give us uh, a good indication of who's interested and who's not. And uh, we'll follow up. And uh, there's a question by Ganesh K. Would Srishti Vigyana be covered in the course on matter? It will be covered in the course on export Hinduism. Uh, the, the overview. I the mean, overview. The, the whole thing is part of exploring Hinduism. It's just that the term exploring Hinduism is kind of attached with the first overview part. Uh, oh, so it will be covered in the overview course. Yes. Oh, exploring Hinduism overview course, it will be covered. I think on two sessions it will be covered. Yes. And uh, based on that construct, how do we not perpetrate and carry forward the coinage of Hindu versus uh, uh, Bharat civilization. Uh, uh, how do we not? Uh, we didn't see, understand. So, so, see, basically, we're talking about a knowledge civilization. Whichever part of the world you're in, and you have to have the desa char because the desh that you are in, look to what is near. When we say Hindu civilization, the desa char of Kashmir is very different from the desa char of Kerala. 
the Desachar of Arunachal Pradesh is very different from the Desachar of Baluchistan, which is the stretch of the land of Bharat. You can't have the, the same Desachar everywhere. Like that, the Desachar of India is different from the Desachar of Fiji or UAE or Americas or Europe. So you have to live. That is Dharma, to live in connect with the nature in the place you are. And the people around you. People around you. That is Dharma. Dharma is not just something about some religious text. Dharma is your character. You've got to live as per your character. For example, you cannot say, I'm going to do certain things in certain ways. When you live in Alaska, you have to have a certain dress. You have a certain method of living. When you live in, uh, say, Miami, you can't live in igloo. In, say, it's not going to be there for you to live. You can't live in, in Florida and Igloo like yes. that. Now, so, the next question is, does the word Hindu given by Persians, is, has the word been given by Persians and does the word mean peace in Parsi? Because that's, uh, you know, we have addressed exactly this bit in our book. See, uh, we have a series of books yes. which are called Breaking the Myths. And uh, there are four volumes. One is Breaking the Myths on Identity. Breaking the myths about society, breaking the myths about prosperity, and about ability. All the four about the various aspects of this civilization. And uh, we have uh, addressed this particular uh, aspect about uh, thieves, uh, the word Hindu. Uh, some people say it means the black people, the thieves, and uh, because the, that's how it, it's also seen in Persian language. So we have answered that in breaking the myths about identity. Uh, would encourage you to go and uh, uh, have a look at that. It's available on Kindle. And uh, why Hindus who were so prosperous not able to spread their language? Who said we didn't spread our language? Half oh. the words today in the world over are you? They share the same root. Yesterday from, we, yeah, it's all it, see. It's a it's a lang Indian language. For example, yesterday we spoke of the word no. We were in another webinar yesterday. The word English yeah. word king, Kaiser. Kaiser, the German word Kaiser, the, the Dutch word for king. Kyonik. All that comes from the word? Kesar. Kesari. Kesari. Kesar. It's a, it's a, it's a, what do you call flower? Kesar. It's a sweet saffron, dish. Kesar. Saffron. Kesar. That's what she's wearing. She's wearing that. that Color. Uh, Kesar. But also. Like that, if, if, if you word the, if you look at the word regal, Reginald, that comes from the Indian word, Hindu word Raja. Rajan, Maharaja, that's the root of the word. So you got a thousands and thousands of words in all the language of the, of the world, which have roots in Hindu literature. You look at the word mother, ma, father, brother, comes from brata. Every word, right from one to 10. We did dominate the world narrative in terms of uh, for instance, you saw Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, all of them wanting to come to this part of the world. Now it is only in the last 200, 300 years that the narrative has changed. And uh, now we can wake up. We are waking up and uh, we are coming together. And it's just a matter of time when this narrative will also change uh, the world. We will be able to change the world narrative. Actually, if you look at the, we just... Uh put up on social media a couple of days back that the names of the months are all from the Hindu thought. Look at the names. September, October, November, December. December Das comes from, from Dasa, Desi, Decimal, Dasa from 10. November, Nav, 9. October, Okta, Ashta, September 7. Saat, Sapta, so what happened was from being 7, 8, 9, 10, it was shifted to 9, 10, 11, 12. So September 7th is the ninth month. Originally, it was the seventh, uh, uh, seventh month because Julius Caesar and his uh, successor, Augustus Caesar, wanted their names as months. So July and August came in between. And September from being the seventh month went on to become the ninth month. Because July was inserted. Yes. Then if, if Julius Caesar can insert a month by name July, his, his successor, Augustus Caesar, could insert a name called August. And July and August must have 31 days because they were royal months inserted by royal. So what did they do? They, they picked up two dates from February. Ju so July picked up a date from February. So February from 30 became 29. And then 
And then Augustus Caesar wanted one day because he didn't want to be one less than, than July, July Caesar. So what did he do? He picked up one more day from, from February. So it became 31 days. That's why July and August are 31 days. That is February has 28 days. Look at how. So how things have changed. This we have written an article, of the names of months. It's called Story of December in our blog for free read. Like that, there's so much Hindu thought has offered to the world in variety of subjects. Why? The name January comes from Janus. Janus has got two heads. And is a, a divinity for doors opening. Beginnings. Who is, beginnings. Who is a divinity for beginning? Ganesha. So Gana, Jana. So Ganesha is for knowledge. Janus is also for opening. So Jana, not. Dana, mana. <laughs> so all that. So Jana, so Janus and Ganesha go together. A, we have written a full article on how the concept of, of Ganesha and Janus is there also. We have not a film on it. Uh, uh, there is this uh, thing about uh, one uh, on the chat I'm seeing about uh, you did not mention values. Without values, there is no meaning in a civilization. Uh, we will see in Hindu contribution uh, part two uh, on in the mind, uh, we will see how the concept of fables itself, uh, you know, Aesop's fables, all the fables fundamentally are for moral, moral stories. And uh, the roots for these fables and how in the form of Panchatantra and Jataka, they have traveled world over from India. And uh, if you go back further again, you know, we will see very interesting comments made by the British when they look at the Indian education system, which was fundamentally focused on values. So like, you know, even in the beginning when I was just walking you, walking you through some of the slides, like where I said it, the emphasis was on soft skills in the Hindu education style. So these soft skills were all about teaching moral, moral values before they te taught you the three R's. So they grounded you in values first and then only let you lose, uh, uh, you know, to go and study the world. Because then, you know, you, you, they know that you will gain things, look at things in the right perspective. Yes, Mr. S. R. that is right. January was, is not the first month in the Hindu calendar. If you start with the month of April, when the sun crosses the equator up north, that's a wish to, we call it, is Vishwadatta Rekha, that is equator equal. So when it crosses north, because all of us are in the northern hemisphere, when it crosses north is when your new year starts. Yeah, but when they wanted the first month, look at, they have named it as Janus. So for them, they are, I mean, the point we were trying to make is, for beginnings, when for them, when January was made the beginning, the first month, they resorted to a divinity who is the divinity of beginnings. And that kind of a divinity for beginnings exists in Hindu thought in the form of Ganesha. Because he is a god for intellect and mind. So uh, that, that is a tattva. Uh, you know, uh, Ganesha is actually a tattva. He is not a physical person. The, the way Rama and Krishna existed as avatars, Ganesha is not an avatar uh, form of a divinity. So what is that divinity, uh, Ganesha, all about? And uh, so these are kind of things that we will actually uh, see in the course. And actually, uh, here Ankur is asking about uh, festivals. I think we will deal with festivals uh, as a separate set of course. Probably in the next uh, semester, whenever uh, Sim goes, uh, yes, we have a full set on. Uh, it's a 20 uh, session course on only understanding the Hindu Utsav festivals. In fact, one of our books on Deepavali is already there on Kindle. Please uh, read there it. There are about some 450 pages on Deepavali and why Deepavali is associated with firecrackers as well, because that's one of the uh, you know hot debates, hot <laughs> literally sparking debates that's been going on. The last few years. So the connect between Deepavali and fest, uh, fireworks is also there in that. Yeah, please read the book on Kindle. It, it's our, our book. Uh, it's part of the Autobiography of India series. You can read. It's a, it, it gives a complete detail about Deepavali. Why firecrackers? Why, in, why can't Deepavali be celebrated in the month of March? But why should it be celebrated only now? And what does our Deepavali mean? Deepavali. Avali means row. Row of something. So row of lights is Deepavali. That's what it means. And actually, Deepavali is a one-month festival till recently. It's been abridged the way we abridge everything nowadays. It's been abridged to a three-day, four-day festival now. So that's how it's happened. And I thought there's a very early question uh, from, I think, one Mr. Ramesh who asked a question long back in the Zoom chat. I saw it early. Yes, uh, Mr. Ramesh Rao, yes. Alumnus of Shivali, I taught, oh, I taught the Bangalore uh, Valley School, thank you. 
Just a, a heads up, we're at 10.10, so we're past the one hour, but as was mentioned, we'll try to keep answering questions. Uh, I, I understand it's late in India right now, right? That's okay. Uh, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> it's sort of a Saturday night for us. Yeah, when, you do, when we do the courses also, it's rather early in India then. <laughs> Especially now getting into winter, it'll be early. <laughs> Yes, and uh, yeah, there, there's uh, somebody who has said, Sumant, uh, who has said Jai Gurudev. Yes, Jai Gurudev to you too. Um, this concept of guru itself is a beautiful concept. You can read our, our book, it's about 100 pages on the word guru. Why do you need a guru? Who is a guru? Who are all the gurus? How do you have a guru? It's available for free read in our website in the mini book section. We have about 60 plus books of mini books, what we call mini yeah, books. I just share the screen. Just you, to... you can just go there and see the books. You can enjoy it. Uh, it's available in our website. Uh, please do visit it. You'll, you'll get a lot of information. It's Most of our content is actually available for free read in our website. Please do. There's a book on Eclipse and uh, you can read that. There's another section called mini books. You can go down there. Uh, you can see the mini book section. Go there. Uh, there are about 60 plus mini books there for free read. Please enjoy them. On agriculture, trade, industry, architecture, Ramasetu, culture, on Guru. See, there's a book, full book on Guru. It's about 100 plus pages. There's one book on yoga, under, just on Kolam and Rangoli. You can just click on the book itself and, and read. Then it read just it opens there, up, free right read. There, there itself. So there'll be a lot of things that you can read anytime you it's have about 126 time. pages just on the word guru there's a book there then there's books on different regions of india like utkala janani kashmira puravasini bharat mata so all these books are there for just for free read on skanda muruga that is shiva's son there's a book then on, there's on environment uh, we had a little boy called Skanda in our previous uh, course. Course session. Then on Kumbh, we have, we have books here on Deepavali for read for people. There was somebody who had asked, I mean, what, what do you write your courses for? Uh, see, all our books are, uh, have been written uh, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, basis that, you know, somebody who has uh, just passed school and has that knowledge of science and uh, about the world will be able to understand and grasp uh, uh, whatever we have a lot of pictures uh, like we showed you in that uh, particular small book lot uh, interspersed with a lot of pictures, lot of pictures. To see. all our books are full of pictures with so a picture speaks thousand words and uh, so uh, so anybody from uh, you know like uh, sixth grade onwards uh, should be easily able to read and understand uh, these books and uh, which is why we these courses are also called for teens and parents uh, uh, fundamentally, it's also to encourage dialogue. You know, it's, it's within not the family on the in the family dining table. The idea is the Hindu thought is you have dial you sit together, eat together, discuss together, and one of the key aspects of the Hindu exploring Hinduism course that we are the Hema and I are doing for HU is that we bring back this dialogue on the dining table. So you eat together, discuss as family because you're discussing just some films and something else. You can discuss about the Hindu thought in your home, in your drawing room, on your dining table. That's one of the key things we and, want and to do. And as a family, you know, when you participate in certain pujas or when you do festivals, celebrate festivals together, uh, you will do it with a collective knowledge of a common ground of understanding as well as to why you're doing these things. And uh, you will re start relishing it much better. Stop sharing. Yeah, stop sharing. Yeah. You can get back there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who, who, how old was your youngest student in exploring Hinduism for teens and parents? Uh, I'm uh, sure you had some young, it was great to see young people, right? Yeah, yeah. Participate. They were, they were about, uh, 12, 12 and so 12, on. 13, all these people. There. They had students in the age group of 9, 10, 11, in, in, not just this particular course here with HU, in other courses also with, with other institutions that we've done. Actually, I'll tell you, there was a class 6, grade 6 student who once came to us in the course, he had read one of our books as part of the course material and he explained the information to us better than us, to us. 
he had he had read the book he had, he had gone through our course and he was a son of a cook in a temple and he explained it so well to us you know and we paused to listen to him amazing we have had many experience of youngsters explaining to us what we explained to them they explained much better actually more than uh, doing the course we enjoy the question answer session beautiful beautiful uh, uh we're coming in on the last few questions do you want to take a few more and then we'll do closing kind of sure. thoughts and statements yeah i think that this is it there is a, the question itself is rather long uh, it's all about uh, the outlook one needs to start somewhere yes i'll achieve moksha after that many births one needs to start somewhere yes definitely <laughs> Let's start somewhere, and we'll all achieve moksha. All of us, okay, no problem. All of us will achieve someday or other. Okay, we shall overcome someday. Hum hongi kamyab. Okay, there's not a doubt about that. And uh, any other uh, questions that we have missed out? Anybody would like to sort of repost because there are hundreds of questions, so we may have missed some of them. So if you've got any other questions, please feel free to ask. If we know, we'll happily share. Very good. I'm going to close the poll in a, in just another minute. Maybe if you didn't fill it out, please do. If you fill out the first one, I had to recreate it. Please fill this out. It's again, it'll make it easy for us to follow up. And we appreciate you. We appreciate you being on this webinar and asking your questions. We appreciate yeah. Dr. DK Hurry and Dr. Uh, DK Hamahari for uh, sharing and being so encouraging and positive and inclusive and willing to answer questions. Um, it's just uh, this is this has been one of my favorite webinars, and we do them every Saturday. And uh, we encourage you to participate in whatever way you can in this uh, Hindu rejuvenation that is happening across the world in, in the University of America with our partners like Bharatnyan and Dr. D.K. Hari, Dr. D.K. Hemari are, are part of it. But you, as attendees, regular Hindus across the world, are integral and have to be a part of it. And we encourage you and we welcome you to be a part of what we're doing here. There's a question from, can I answer some question, Ankur? Yeah, yeah, please. There's a question that asks about creation from SHI, I'm going to bring the balance name. It's there about, uh, we have set a series of uh, short films called Creation. It's about 20 plus short films in our YouTube channel. Please visit it because uh, the question you asked, we have to give a lot of details for answers. It's already available as film and yeah, three, no. four of our articles available on creation. Please do read it and you can post your questions and we'll be happy to answer there on. But uh, also about uh, what are the major and immediate steps to need, that need to be taken to save God's creation by the side effects or bad side of human creations. I think you should really attend that you, uh, Hindu contributions to the world uh, in the realm of matter uh, course then. Because that is where we will see how the Hindus were flourishing and were prosperous they were able to lead a very material uh, based, I mean, lead a spiritual life amongst a lot of all the material riches, okay, very easily. We, we had no problems. But when these riches were let loose on certain other civilizations, what drove them? How did they change? And which is what has caused the world to be what it is today? The roots of what we are today lie actually in the... Uh, the greed, the uh, whatever the Hindus had to give, the greed for that is what has led to the world the way it is today. And that story is what we will see when we do the Hindu contribution. Actually, that is what we are trying to tell the world when we do the scores. We are not trying to tell that, oh, look, we gave this, we gave that. That is not important. Who gives sugar today is not important. But what are the lessons to learn from the story of sugar, from the story of indigo? These are what are important. And uh, that perhaps once you, and, and then when we go on to the uh, second part of the course in the realm of mind, we will see how the Hindus managed to straddle these two worlds very easily. Matter but why haven't the, why hasn't the world today been able to do that? 
and therefore what are the kind of paradigm shifts that are needed that is what we will see in the realm of mind so there again we will see a lot about what the hindu civilization has given but after that what what are we supposed to do with that kind of a knowledge what is the learning we have to take back home that is what is more important and therefore how can the hindus again influence the world once again to come back to a sense of balance i don't that know if you observed she made a very profound statement i don't know how many of you caught it i don't know if she has caught it i'll tell you what it was these are some gems are huh, coming <laughs> from his mouth <laughs> Like, no, 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 really. <laughs> See, in the Hindu thought, when you have prosperity, you know how to go spiritual. You know how to go inward and not be lavish or be uh, stuck on only the material wealth. You go beyond the karma. That is essential to a Hindu thought. Whereas in a non-Hindu thought, the moment you excess wealth, you just do not know how to handle it. it spirals you down the tube see that is why the difference between if you look at the concept between hiranyakashipu and prahlada that's the difference hiranyakashipu is an asura what does the word hiranyakashipu mean it means a man who slept hiranya means golden there kashipu is his bed his cot his cot was made of gold So was so opulent, he did not know how to handle it. Handle it. That, that's all. He just lost it. See, Whereas, there it gives arrogance. Prosperity gives arrogance rather than spiritual calm balance, which is what Hindu thought is very essential for that it, balance, striking that note of balance. That is the sama. You, that's why you have the concept of sama, which is very Hindu in idea, and to be grounded. And what did Buddha do when he got? the en, uh, the enlightenment what's the first act of buddha when he got enlightenment you will see that when you go to bodh gaya even today even you know we'll see it the main shrine the main buddha the the shrine where buddha's enlightenment i mean main bodh gaya kept bodh gaya you will see on top of that shrine there will be buddha seated there and he will be with his hand he will be touching the ground his hand will be touching the ground the first act of buddha after getting enlightenment was, was what touched the ground so he was grounded he was not elevated he was enlightened but not elevated i mean he was, he was grounded not levitating he was elevated no i mean in that sense yes but he was not levitating and uh, flying away this we have discussed grounded. one full chapter in our book uh, brand bharat future from india how that is a hindu thought all this we deal with when we deal in the in the chapter on hindu contributions to the mind Okay, there are twelve more questions and messages. You can take that. So these are like there's so much we can go on and go on discussing all these things. Oh, well, thank you so much, uh, Gaurang. Uh, Gaurang Vaishnav, yes, oh, yes. And then uh, what about uh, how about Gayatri Mantra signs? And uh, but, 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 Vijay is asking us about our YouTube channel. It is Bharat Gyan B H A R A T H G Y A N is our YouTube channel. There are about three hundred and seventy short films in it. You are welcome to go enjoy all of them. Uh, they are available in English, Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, and uh, Canada. Quite a few other languages as well. You just go enjoy all of them. See the fundamental aspect, you know. Uh, uh, There, there is a subtle difference between uh, a homa and a yagna. Okay, a yagna. Uh, you you'll be wondering why am I saying this all of a sudden? Uh, it's in connection with that question by uh, Ikkyosa about uh, Gayatri mantra signs. See the fundamental root ya is it means to spread, to to diffuse, to uh, so uh, yatra. which means to travel to go around to spread so yagna are uh, unlike i mean uh, from homa the distinction of a yagna are those activities which were done to spread something Yaj. among um, a meaning uh, of, uh, then uh, it's it's in two sense one is to spread uh, praise and uh, uh, into the cosmos of all the divinities that is in a different realm but also to spread message of goodness Uh, around in the world 
so like that gayatri is also that which spreads energies around so energies and knowledge around so there are gayatris for associated with various divinities how to uh, uh, benefit thank you from the, the flow thank you of uh, uh, energies so this the spread these are things uh, that are very important every divinity has a gayatri it's not just one gayatri you have many many gayatris uh, each divinity there will be something which is called a gayatri for that divinity yeah sure thank you as a sure we can do if you as a sure we can do yes yeah, send the email and we'll connect you but that sounds like a, a kind of a great place to end it i don't know if you have some closing thoughts on that idea of spreading in gayatri mantra science but uh let's uh make our closing statements and uh the webinar replay will be available just fill out the survey i know my internet is cutting out um but the survey if you fill out the survey which you will re receive real soon fill it out you'll get the replay uh soon after so uh closing thoughts make your last invitation and pitch to join your course please <laughs> uh i mean whether they want to understand or not you know these courses give us an opportunity to spread this goodness you know we can't keep it to ourselves actually i, I mean i think this gayatri word is also kind of uh, making us feel i mean there is so much of energy every time we talk about these uh, the goodness that is there uh, in this knowledge base and uh, that we like to spread it and we are very happy to be talking about this to people and the more the number of courses the more the participants the more the questions oh that that's great so we'll be very happy to see all of you there uh, uh, so please make time sure for this great all right and he's busy typing an answer <laughs> great okay. so uh, i'll i'll let the chat stay up for another minute or so but thank you all namaste this has been a great pleasure uh, look forward to continuing our dharmic work with you and everyone on. Namaste. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Namaste. Namaste. Hari Om. Hari Om.